Hi class, this is our lecture video on westward expansion. Our learning target for this, in this lecture you will examine the causes, course, and consequences of rapid western expansion of the United States in the mid-1800s. At the end of this lecture you need to be able to identify significant territorial acquisitions on an outline map, explain the reasons behind migrations to both Oregon and Utah, describe what life was like for those that traveled the Oregon Trail and Mormon Trail, explain how Texas gained its independence from Mexico and came, became part of the United States, and finally explain why the United States went to war with Mexico, how it won that war, and what effect it had on the expansion of the United States. The central idea in a lot of this Western expansion was manifest destiny. This phrase was coined by John O'Sullivan in 1845. He was a newspaper editor, and it's going to become popular throughout the 1800s in the United States. It's used to rationalize or explain U.S. expansion across North American continent. This is a painting that's usually used to kind of depict manifest destiny, and I think we've looked at this in most of my classes and talked about it a little bit. Um, Really, the idea behind it is that control of America in North America is the destiny of the United States. This is something that's fated to happen. And this philosophy of manifest destiny is used to justify United States growth and expansion into the West, industrialization, uh, also the removal of Native Americans, and the war with Mexico. This is a map of territorial expansion of the United States from the end of the American Revolution to 1853. And you have a blank copy of this map in your notes. And I want you to fill in all the sections and label all the sections of this. Uh, the United States started as the original 13 colonies along the Atlantic coast. After the war was over with the Treaty of Paris, added this additional section. Um, we've already learned about the Louisiana Purchase when Thomas Jefferson was president and the Florida Session that took place while James Monroe was president. We learned about how Andrew Jackson invaded Florida. Um, we're going to look in this lecture about the acquisition of Texas, Oregon, and in this area, the Mexican Session. The main goal of this was California. And then finally, the Gadsden Purchase. So make sure you have all those labeled in your notes. So the first target of American expansion is going to end up being Oregon. Um, the land of the Oregon Territory was claimed at various times by Spain, Britain, Russia, and then finally the United States. None of these countries had really encouraged any significant settlement in this area, so most of the inhabitants that lived there were Native Americans. There were very few people of European ancestry that were there. A lot of this is because the area was extremely remote. It's hard to get to from either Europe or from the Atlantic coast of the United States. Usually to travel over here, the option would be traveling overland, which was very, very difficult. You had to cross multiple mountain ranges, areas of desert, things like that. The other option would be sailing all the way around South America and then sailing back up the coast, which is a really long journey, sometimes a year or longer to try and make that, that trip. So it was a hard area for anybody to get to. The first Americans that are going to start arriving here are going to be in the early 1800s, and they're going to be fur traders who are hunting and trading for beaver pelts. This furry little guy right here. Beaver fur was very valuable because it was waterproof. It was used to make all kinds of things from hats, coats, blankets, things like that. Some of the very first early entrepreneurs that landed in this area, they would establish trading posts. One of the more famous ones was established by a guy named John Jacob Astor in Astoria in Oregon, right about there. Uh, a lot of these fur trappers, they adopted Native American culture. Some of them were really tough guys. These were mountain men who were used to surviving on their own. Uh, tough guys like Jed Smith and Jim Bridger. To give you an idea of what these guys were like, uh, there's a story about Jed Smith getting attacked by a grizzly bear. The bear had his whole head in his mouth and had torn off a big chunk of his scalp and one of his ears. And he managed to get free from the bear by playing dead, and the bear left him alone. When his buddies went to help him, 
he asked his friend to stitch all the skin back onto his skull and his friend was trying to do it. And he's like, I don't think I can do a very good job of this. And Jed Smith ended up taking the needle and Fred and stitching his own scat back onto his skull. And then about two weeks later, he was back leading parties through the mountains. So these were very tough guys. By the mid-1800s, you start having families of farmers that start migrating to the Oregon Territory, and they traveled on a route that was known as the Oregon Trail that started over here in an area Independence, Missouri. The distance was nearly 2,000 miles. They would usually take six months or more to travel this distance. If it took much longer than that, they had a good chance of not surviving. Their final goal was an area, this dark green patch that you see right here at the end was called the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, mild climate, fertile soil, lots of rainfall, good farmland. Um, in 1839, there were only about 50 white settlers in this area, but by 1846, there's more than 6,000. So this is a pretty significant wave of people that travels on this trail. The trail itself was really dangerous. There was foul weather, rainstorms, snowstorms, treacherous rivers that had to be crossed where there were no bridges, there might be rapids, things like that. Uh, often when they're tra crossing these rivers, they might have to try and float their wagon across or wait until the river got a little bit lower or maybe travel along the river until they found a spot that was shallow enough for them to cross. They'd have to claw, cross all these mountains, all this white that you see on this relief map. Those are mountains that they would have to cross over. They'd try and have to find passes where they could get through the mountains. It would be hard on their animals trying to pull the wagons up and down through the mountains. It would be dangerous. There were wild animals to deal with. Sometimes even crime was a problem where people in the party that were traveling together might commit violence against one another or rob one another. I mean, it was a very dangerous journey. The number one problem for these travelers was disease. Um, most of the people that died along the Oregon Trail died from diseases like cholera, dysentery, measles, typhoid fever. Um, used to be, there's a video game called Oregon Trail. That's what this picture is from. And if you've ever played the, the game, you know that diseases is the main thing that you have to worry about as you're traveling the trail. So this is your first practice. You got four true false statements I would like you to answer. You can pause the video to answer those. The next target for migration was Utah. And you got to give some backstory to look at this. So it's all going to start with the founding of a new religion in New York called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who are more commonly known as the Mormons today. They're founded by a guy named Joseph Smith in New York, and he, according to the, the history of the church, he is visited by angels in the forest, and they lead him to some tablets that have another teaching of Christianity, and he writes all this down, and that becomes the Book of Mormon. This church is going to grow very rapidly in membership. Uh, what's going to happen, though, is they're going to get attacked by other Christians for a lot of their religious beliefs. Um, an example would be that many Mormon men at the time practiced polygamy, which is a man having more than one wife. Joseph Smith probably had anywhere from 40 to 50 wives over the course of his lifetime. And Eventually, this practice is going to get outlawed by the church in 1890, but it caused a lot of problems for them then. So they're going to migrate from New York into Ohio. They have problems in Ohio. They head to Missouri. They have problems in Missouri, and then they're going to end up in Illinois. Uh, when they're in Illinois, the Joseph Smith is going to get murdered by a mob, and his second in command, a guy named Brigham Young, is going to take over as leader. Brigham Young is going to decide that the only way they can practice their religion freely is if they migrate someplace that is outside of the jurisdiction of the United States and also that is someplace that nobody else wants to bother going to. So he's going to decide to migrate his people to Utah around the area of Great Salt Lake. His reasoning was that Utah itself was 
barren. It was desolate. Nobody wanted to live there. And that was a good way to kind of keep out the non-believers. This photograph is what that area looks like and would have looked like back then when they migrated there. This was also part of Mexico. It was outside of U.S. territory, and the Mexicans were basically ignoring this territory because it didn't seem too valuable to them. So that's where the Mormons are going to head. And by 1860, about 40,000 Mormons were in Utah, and eventually their settlement's going to get very large there. Even today, most of the people that live in Utah are um, Mormon. Practice number two, true-false. There's four statements. Pause the video if you need to and answer those ones. Next target for American migration is going to be Texas. In 1821, Mexico is going to gain its independence from Spain. The map that you see here, this shows you the Viceroyalty of New Spain. This is basically the territory that Mexico got when it became independent. You can see this stretches way up to where Oregon would be today along the Louisiana Purchase, all this area of Texas and New Mexico, California, Colorado, Nevada, all of this was part of Mexico. So Mexico owned Texas. There were very few people that actually lived there and Mexico wanted to encourage some growth there. Um, without people, it'd be harder for them to protect it. People would mean extra tax revenue, so they wanted to encourage growth. So they're going to offer cheap land to Americans who migrate and settle inside Mexico in the area of Texas. They appointed land agents who were called impresarios, and these guys were hired to help bring in the settlers. They're kind of like the real estate agents for this deal. Um, the most famous one was Stephen F. Austin. In 1822, he's going to bring the first group of American settlers into Texas. They're going to be nicknamed the Old 300 because there were 300 families and they're going to settle in this region. Now, for the Americans to get this cheap land off Mexico, there was one catch. The Americans needed to follow Mexico's laws. This included um, converting to the Catholic religion. They had to conduct all their business in the Spanish language. They also had to not practice slavery because slavery was illegal in Mexico. Well, big surprise, the Americans don't follow any of these laws, especially the one banning slavery. Lots of these Texas settlers, they bring in their slaves because they want to set up cotton plantations in eastern Texas. Eventually, Texas is going to declare its independence from Mexico because they're going to start to differ from them culturally and politically, and a war is going to break out between Mexico and the province of Texas. A guy named Sam Houston is going to be elected president of Texas. Uh, they're going to have a Declaration of Independence. It's modeled after the American Declaration of Independence. They made no secret that they wanted to become part of the United States. Uh, he's also going to become commander of Texas's army. The Mexican dictator at the time was a guy named General Santa Ana. He's going to march on Texas with about 6,000 men. Now, Santa Ana's problem is as he marches on Texas, you know, he's got a very large area of Texas that he needs to subdue. So as he starts moving into Texas, he has to start dividing up his forces so that he can spread them out and try and subdue all the Texans. And that's going to kind of be his downfall in the end. Uh, there's a couple of significant battles that I want you to know about with uh, Texas's revolution. First one is the Siege of the Alamo. This one is kind of a, a famous battle because the odds were so great against the Texans. Basically, about 200 men fortify themselves in an abandoned mission near San Antonio. And their mission is to try and slow down Santa Ana's army so that uh, Sam Houston and his army of Texans can get ready to actually fight Santa Ana. So these Texans who are here, they're just trying to buy some time. Uh, they're going to actually hold off a Mexican army of about 4,000 men for nearly two weeks before they get overwhelmed and all of the Texans are killed. But... Their effort does buy Sam Houston enough time to get organized. Houston's going to get his revenge at the Battle of San Jacinto. Santa Ana kept having to divide up his troops. Makes the numbers a little more manageable for the Texans to deal with. He gets surprised by the Texans and actually gets captured. 
Since the Texans captured him, they force him to sign a peace treaty, giving them their independence. And that's the only way they're going to release him. So Santa Ana, he signs the treaty. Once he gets away, he has no intention of really honoring it, but it gives the Texans their independence. Texas then asked to join the United States as a slave state. Andrew Jackson and then Martin Van Buren were their presidents during all of this. They were really concerned that adding Texas to the United States was going to upset the balance in the Senate between the free and the slave states. Um, it would cause all kinds of sectional problems. So what ends up happening is Texas ends up becoming an independent republic on its own for about 10 years. That's why it's known as the Lone Star Republic, their nickname. Here's practice number three, four two false questions. Pause the video so you can answer those. This brings us to the presidency of James Knox Polk. Now, he ran on a platform of expanding the size of the United States, and he had a couple of goals that he wanted to accomplish as president. He wanted to annex Texas, make it part of the United States. He wanted to get international recognition for American control over the Oregon Territory, get all those other countries out of there. He wanted to acquire California from Mexico, and in doing all of these things, it was going to make the United States stretch from sea to shining sea. It was going to fulfill this idea of manifest destiny that the United States is supposed to spread out and control all the way across from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, he was from Tennessee, very much a Jacksonian politician. He nicknames himself Young Hickory as opposed to Jackson's Old Hickory because he wants to capitalize on that recognition. He also promised, it's kind of unusual, that he would only serve one term in office. His goal was to accomplish all of these things in his one term as president. This is how he kind of re resolves things. So with Oregon, he threatens to go to war with Britain. And the Britain realized that this is probably not a war they can win if the United States wants to try and conquer Oregon. And they're going to basically kind of split the Oregon territory with the Americans, with them getting the northern half, where we would think of today as British Columbia, and the United States getting the southern half, the area that we would think of as Washington and Oregon. With Texas, he wants to get Texas into the United States the adding Texas is really unpopular in the Senate, and normally it would require a treaty, which requires two-thirds approval. He's going to get around this by doing something that might have been a little unconstitutional. He's going to add Texas with a congressional resolution that only takes a majority vote, more than 50%. And with that, the United States is going to annex Texas in 1845. When it comes to acquiring California in the Southwest, first he's going to try and buy it from Mexico. Uh, when that doesn't work, he basically kind of manufactures an incident that will start a war between the two countries so that he can just go and conquer the territory. Here's practice number four. Pause the video so you can answer these four true false questions. So now his target is California and the rest of the Southwest. So this was a huge swath of territory that goes from Texas all the way up to where Oregon is. All of this land at that time was part of Mexico. So what Polk is going to do is he needs a war to break out. So he's going to move American troops into the area in between the Nueces River right here and the Rio Grande River. Now, with the treaties and stuff that were made with Texas, this was the Nueces River was supposed to be the border between the two areas, but the United States was claiming that the Rio Grande River was actually the border. So Polk's going to move his troops in here. Now, you've got lots of Mexican farmers and citizens that are living in this area. So when the American troops show up and start to build forts in this area, the Mexican citizens are going to move out. And of course, the Mexicans are going to move to try and confront the Americans. And big surprise, they start shooting at each other, and a war breaks out. So the declared goal of the war was to avenge American honor, and speeches are made about how this is uh, American blood spilled on American soil. All of that's a little questionable. It seems like the real reasons for this war were to get lots of extra land that would allow the expansion of slavery and also slave states, 
but also land that could be used to build railroads that would cross over to the coast of California. California was viewed as the real prize. This was the valuable land. So building railroads across here would facilitate the economic growth of the United States. So Congress is going to declare war. Lots of Americans are going to volunteer. Um, state of Tennessee is going to have a huge amount of volunteers in this war. That's one of the reasons why it's known as the volunteer state. And the United States is going to prosecute this war very aggressively. They're going to attack Mexico. Um, and for the most part, the entire war is going to go the Americans' way. So this Mexican-American war is a very one-sided contest. Not that the Mexicans didn't think they had a good chance of winning. They, the Mexicans believed that they could win this war. They thought they were going to march all the way to Washington, D.C. And there were a lot of European countries that thought Mexico was going to win this war. But it ends up being a very one-sided contest. You have some rising military stars among the Americans that pop up during this war. And I don't want to talk about every single little battle, but I think it's important to kind of frame the contribution of some of these individuals because they're going to pop up in politics later on as we're learning about the development of the United States towards the Civil War. Uh, one famous guy that is a general named Zachary Taylor, and he's going to launch attacks from Texas. He's going to be kind of in the middle of this war when it starts in leading these troops. He's going to win a big victory for the Americans at the city of Monterey. At the time, he's actually going to be viewed as a political rival. He is a member of the Whig Party, whereas uh, James Knox Polk is a member of the Democrats. And all the success he's having, uh, Polk is going to get a little worried about this guy becoming a political rival of his. So he's going to kind of stall Taylor in this area around Monterey. And for his next big attack, he's going to send a guy named Winfield Scott. And Winfield Scott is going to launch an amphibious attack on the city of Veracruz down here. And he's going to march towards Mexico City to capture Mexico City. Winfield Scott is also a Whig, so he's going to also become a political rival of Polk later on. Uh, another military general named Stephen Kearney is going to be sent from Kansas. He's going to eventually capture San Diego and Los Angeles. And the Americans are also going to send a guy named John C. Fremont, who's going to head to Northern California. And he's going to try and inspire a revolt among Californians that are sympathetic to joining the United States. Sort of a little independence movement called the Bear Flag Revolt. And this is going to go on in Northern California. Um, other than Kearney, all these men use their military frame to try and to launch into careers in politics. At one point or another, Taylor, Scott, and Fremont all end up running for president at different points in time. The U.S. is going to really use Mexico as a punching bag for this whole war. Um, and they're finally going to capture Mexico City. The end result of the war is that Mexico is going to end up giving almost half of its territory to the United States. And all of this land that you see up here on the map, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, uh, chunks of Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, all of this territory is going to be ceded to the United States. Now, the U.S. is going to make a treaty called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and that's what's going to end the Mexican-American War. But surprise, the United States wants a little more land from Mexico. It turns out the United States wanted to build a railroad through this territory, and they discover that the best route is actually a route that goes into Mexican territory. They were looking for a route that had the least amount of mountains, because railroads don't like mountains. So... In order to not have the American Railroad running through Mexican territory, uh, a negotiator named James Gadsden is going to be sent to negotiate the U.S. purchase of this land. And with the Gadsden purchase, they're going to buy all this land it, you see here on the map that's in southern Arizona and New Mexico. And this purchase is going to kind of complete what we think of today as the continental United States. Here's your last practice. Well, not your last practice, your second to last practice. Practice number five, these are two false questions. Pause the video if you need to. This is your last practice. With this one, I want you to identify the people being described in each one of these questions. 
just the last name is fine. And that's going to conclude our video on Westward Expansion.